Hey everybody, here's a quick video showing you how you can set these two devices up and use them together to perform. This is the OPZ by Teenage Engineering and the Korg Nano Control 2. I'm going to show you how to set up the Nano Control with some custom mappings so that you can manipulate whatever parameters on the OPZ that you want for performance. So let's jump in. The first thing you need to figure out how to use is this Korg um, control editor software. You can download this from the Korg website and this is how you edit what messages your nano control is sending to the OPZ. So the first thing to be aware of is that each of these columns is considered a separate group. So each group has a fader, a knob, and three buttons. And you can assign each group here to its own MIDI channel so that these all send on different MIDI channels, right? So I have these set up to send on MIDI channels 1 through 8 respectively, which coordinates with the first 8 audio tracks of the OPZ that kick through the core track. So the first thing I uh, assigned was the fader because I wanted to control the volume of each of those tracks. So you might wonder how do I know which CC to assign to, to, for the volume, for example. That's when you refer to the incoming MIDI reference chart on the manual, which you can find on the Teenage Engineering website. It has lots of cool stuff. Um, so I first went to System Here and to Track Gain. So if you look at the CC value, it's going to be a CC of 50 on the channel 1 through 16. Like I said, we have 1 through 8, and the range is 0 through 127. So I basically set all the faders, you can see I've set them to 50, which is our gain value. CC 50, 0 through 127, that will give you the full MIDI range of what you want to send. And I noticed that there's another option here, there's track gain relative. I tried that one out, um, and it did not give me the result I wanted. Basically what I want is to be able to pre-mix all my stuff and then just use the faders to fade in and fade out not really changing the gain outside of what I've already pre-mixed. That's way, that way I know everything sounds pretty good. So this will accomplish that for you. And you'll notice when, I, when I'm moving the fader, it's not showing up on the mixer page. So it's, it's almost acting like a relative mixer, but it's, it's not. But that's the, the result I was looking for, so I was happy with that. Next up is the knobs here at the top. You can assign those to whatever you want. I used FX Send 2, which is where I keep my reverb. So that has CC14. So you just go through and assign all these to 14 or whatever you want. For example, if you want to send some of these to FX Send 2 and some of them to FX Send 1, you can do that just by using the different CC number. FX1 is 13, FX2 is 14. I have them all going to the reverb, which is 14. So here they are. I'll assign to 14, 0 to 127, and that works. And for me, that can be a really useful way to do kind of performance mixing and also transitions. So here I'm sending it to the reverb. So that's a really useful feature for me. Next up, you have the three buttons on each column, each group. Um, so for the solo buttons, I've assigned them to the mute groups. So you'll see mute group, it's going to send on channel or a CC of 55, any channel. And the range is different on this one. It's 0 through 9, which is going to give us our 10, um, our 10 black keys here, which correspond to the mute groups. So the way I set that up is for all the solo buttons, each, CC, each solo button has a CC of 55, but the, the other settings are a little bit different. So the first one, this is uh, the first solo button. I have an on value of 0 and an off value of 127. These are set up with a button behavior of toggle, meaning that each press toggles between a state of on and off. When it's on and lit up, that means it just sent the on value, which is 0. When it's off, it has sent the off value, which is 127. And I use that value because it's out of the range of what we want to use. 
which is zero, uh, zero to nine is our range. So when you send something outside of that, it does nothing. So that way I don't, it's not sending, it's not changing anything with the off value. And the reason I set that up that way is that it's a useful way for me to keep track of which mute group I'm on. So when I go to a different mute group, I simply just unselect the previous mute groups and I re remember, okay, I'm here. Just let me just show you how, how that kind of works. So that's a good way to move through your composition. Move to a new mute group and then just deselect the last one. That way I know I'm on this mute group. And you, you don't necessarily have to unselect them if that doesn't confuse you, but it just helps me keep track of everything. So that was, that was a useful thing for me. Again, that's the toggle button behavior. So next up, we have the mute buttons right here in the middle. And these I just sent, or I set up for individual track mutes, which is this one right here, CC53. And this one has a range of zero and one. So if we look at our mappings here, they're all, all the mute buttons are set to 53, or they should be, these must have gotten, these should be 53. And off value zero, on value one. And that'll just mute and ungroup. And that's another fun performance thing you can do in the moment. One handed. And really, all this just allows me to do stuff that takes two hand or like weird finger combination. Um, and I can do it with one hand. So if I'm on kind of a full mute group. really fun stuff like that. So those are the mute buttons. Here at the bottom we have the record buttons. And so for these ones I used the um, audio, let's see, the audio mute function which is CC54. So I set these all to 54, off value of 0, on value of 1. Somehow these ones must have gotten changed. They should all be 54. Again these are toggle. And if you don't know what audio mute does, it basically will mute the audio of each track going to the master channel, but it will still send the audio to the effects and it will still output the MIDI if you're sending the MIDI anywhere. And this can be useful. For example, I'm just going to mute everything. So I have this sound and when I turn, when I do the audio mute, you can still hear it's it's still sending to the reverb. And then when I unmute it, hear it, we get the dry signal again. So that's a useful way to sneak things in or give your mix a little more depth, have things feel like they're farther back in the mix. So that's it for the um, these groups. Next we'll move on to these transport controls, which are a little bit different in that all these are, are a single group. So you have to assign all these to the same MIDI channel, which is a little limiting, but you can still make good use of it. So I've assigned all these to MIDI channel one. And then the reason I did that is because I wanted access to this parameter, the active track parameter, which is how you cycle through um, which track you're your iPad is referencing. And normally you'd have to do that by holding the track button and then, you know, press pressing these different the different tracks, which is okay, but when you're in the moment and you want to do it really quickly, um, this can be a better way to do it. So you'll notice it says track slash channel zero, and that's actually not true because I have these set on channel one. And so I guess that's a mistake in the manual. But yeah, so I, I have basically these bottom buttons set to that active track component. And they're more or less arbitrarily set up. Um, I just go like this through the buttons. Kick, snare, percussion, sample, bass, etc. And then just for sake of remembering, um, I use the cycle button for the tape loop track just because tape loop cycles so that it's an easy way for me to remember. It, it could be useful to set that one up for the performance track if you find yourself wanting to jump immediately to the performance track to do a quick little fill into the next session, section or whatever. But just to show you what that looks like, as I press these different buttons, 
it just automatically pulls up that page, which is really useful. And again, you can set up whatever you want to those buttons. If you need to access different tracks, then that's cool too. Finally, we have these track buttons, which I have set up to navigate through different patterns. So if we look up here under uh, system again, we have next pattern and previous pattern. These both send on a CC of 103. So I've assigned those to, as you can see, CC 103, and they send a value of 16 or 17 respectively. Value of 17 will go back a pattern. Value of 16 will go forward a pattern. So if you click here, here's our backwards. And right now I have these set as momentary. The on value is 17. The off value is again out of the range of what it's receiving. This one actually will only receive 16 or 17. So for example, if I had set that at 17, since it's toggle, or since it's momentary, excuse me, when I press down, it sends 17. And if I were to release again, it would also send 17, which I don't want, because then it would toggle back two patterns. So I just have this, this can be any value that's just outside of the range. That way when I release the button, it won't change anything. I only get a change when I press down. So yeah, you use 17 for the back, um, 16 for the next pattern. And this is super useful for me because if I don't want to hold down the, the project button to toggle through the next pattern, um, then I can do that. So it's kind of, I'm holding the phone with one hand, so I can't, you might not be able to see this very well, but for example, um, so I'm here on this pattern. When I press this forward button, now I'm here on the second pattern and the next one and the next one and you can go back to just by pressing these. And so that's a really useful thing for me because sometimes I'm mixing and messing with things and then I'm like, oh crap, then I need to get to the next section really quick. So I just boom, press that really quick and then we're at the next pattern. So that's uh, been really helpful for me. Uh, so those are all my mappings I'm using. They're here in the, the editor software. And so once you map everything out and get everything all the th everything mapped out the way you want it. You're going to make sure your nano control is plugged into your computer and you're going to go up here to communication and write scene data. And that's just going to send your patch to your nano control. And then it'll show up. And then that's when you un unplug from your computer and you can plug it directly into your OPZ. Right now I have a USB mini going to a USB C. That way I can kind of avoid the hub um, or the dongle, so to speak. Um, and that's great. It, it will uh, drain your battery a little more quickly than if you have a hub. So if you're doing a longer set, definitely use the hub and that'll, uh, that'll keep it from running out during your set. So I think that's pretty much um, everything. This video is in response to some questions I got from a YouTube performance I did where I'm using this rig. So I'll link that in the description and you can check that out just to see the way I'm using everything I described here. If you have any other questions, feel free to comment or let me know. And uh, I hope you have fun. Just remember you can, you can sign, you can set this up any way you want. You know, this is just my way and I'm still trying to figure out uh, the way to make the best use of this controller. So I'm, I'm going to be experimenting with stuff and just uh, see what I really need to access um, within a performance and just find the system that allows me to be in the moment, which I think is the goal for whatever um, setup you use. So I hope this was helpful. Have a good one, guys.